Okay, everyone, uh, this is Kun Huang again. So here we are going to demonstrate how to use top gene to do functional enrichment and analysis of your gene list. As we mentioned in the lecture, there are many ways you can get a list of genes and you want to find out what are the common things among them. So in our lecture, at the end of the slide, uh, I gave two examples of gene lists. Those are actually real gene lists we generated from co-expression and network analysis of cancers. So I copied the first one. And uh, what we can do here is, let's first go into the top function. Click on it. And the network is low. And the, here is the interface, what you will see. And what you can do is immediately to paste this gene list. So I have this gene list listed in here and I paste into this space. And one thing I'd like to mention here is you can see entry type. When you click on it, there are actually multiple choices. So here what we are using is so-called a gene symbol. And uh, you could use some other choices in sometimes the data, especially for some RNA sequencing data, what you get may not be gene symbol, but instead of like ensemble ID. Or sometimes if you do protein study, proteomics study, what you get is actually uniprot ID or uniprot accession number. So that is something you can put in here without extensively doing some you know, manual conversion or such things, which is very convenient. On the other hand, I have to mention there is actually a large list of different annotations. So here they uh, allow you to use six of them, six mostly commonly, commonly used ones. If you, your data comes with other annotation, annotations, you need to do the conversion. And the other tool, David, has the functionality of actually doing the conversion. Anyway, what you can do is now you have your gene list copied in here, paste it in here. And uh, what you need to do is just say submit. When you submit it, what you see on the here, first thing you, it said, tells you, among the 37 genes you input, only 30 of them are recognized. You may wonder why. So here is actually the list of genes it recognized. But at the bottom here, it says G is not found. Are they really not found? Actually, no. What you can do is here, there is a link at here. You click on, say, find alternatives for missing symbols. You click on it. Then you realize out of the seven genes that are not found, actually, four of them have some matched gene. The reason is those genes, for example, the CDK1, now it's officially called the CDK1, but it, it used to be called the CDC2. So in some early version of annotation, they may people may still be using CDC2, even though they actually meant CDK1. But the confusion part is there is another gene called the POLD1. It also was called CDC2. So in this case, you need to know which one it is. In our case, I'm pretty sure it was CDK1, so I click on it. And for the other genes, I also click on it. Click on it, click on it. And you may say, okay, what's going on here? So that is usually the genes or some annotations from some legacy database, or sometimes those are uh, non-coding genes or unknown genes or pseudo genes, which doesn't have the annotation in the database used by top gene, then unfortunately they will not be included in the downstream analysis. So now we have selected four genes with a different symbol. You click on update. When you click on update, now instead of 30 genes, now you've got 34 genes to analyze. And you may say, what about the rest of three genes? In this case, I'm sorry, they will not be included in our downstream analysis. And uh, then what are the analysis we're doing? 
right? With that enrichment, we talked about the gene ontology, molecular function, biological process, cellular components. Besides that, you see all oh, pathways, they're important pathways, and there are transcription factor binding sites. But there are actually many other things. For example, here is that human phenotype or mouse phenotype. Please notice when they say phenotype, many times those are actually disease phenotypes. Because many of the phenotypes are actually so-called abnormal phenotypes, and that translates to diseases. Another thing is PubMed. What does it mean by PubMed? PubMed means somebody published a paper, and they have a list of genes in boundary result tables. And somebody actually, there are some databases curated those tables, and then they will compare your gene list with their gene list in the table. And then you will also possibly see if there is an enrichment on certain specific related things. And interactions, based on some interaction databases, and are your genes commonly interacting with other genes? Cytoband. Are your genes co-locate on certain specific chromosomal regions? And the rest are also are based on different databases. And one of them is microRNA. MicroRNA is essential to say, are your genes common targets for any specific microRNAs? But in this case, those targets are not necessary are not necessarily validated targets. Those are based on the computational inference from the three prime UTR sequences for those microarrays. So they may be their targets, they may not be their targets, and but those uh, it's, it's, it's actually based on computational prediction. On the second column, you see the essentially correction in p-value cutoff. P-value cutoff is very easy to explain. You can cut at 0 0.05, which is the year they use to commonly use a significance cutoff, but doesn't necessarily be so. You could say I want 0 0.1, or even to say I don't want to cut off at all, which is one. But here, what you see is FDR or none, or FDR B and Y, or FDR bufferoni, uh, bufferoni, not FDR bufferoni. I'm sorry. And the reason for this is, think about it, we are doing a lot of Fisher exact tests. Right? For every possible go, go term, for every table in annotation in human phenotype database, for every annotation and possible pathway, for every band on the chromosome. Right? So it's a lot of tests that we are doing. Very likely, some of the tests will randomly just show significance. So what you can do is actually to correct for false discovery rate. This is a commonly used way for multiple test compensation. If you really want to be very stringent, you can use bufferoni, which is not always recommended, actually. So, but the false discovery rate, there are different ways you can compute it. So this is the commonly used way, and the B and Y is another commonly used way. But sometimes you may say, no, I don't want to do false discovery rate, or I don't want to do multi-test compensation. That's perfectly fine. Especially in certain cases, if you are doing early stage screening, you want to make your customer nest as wide as possible. You may say, no, I don't necessarily want to do multi-test compensation. Just kind of like want to see what may come out. Eventually, you still need to justify it or experimentally validate it. This is especially true sometimes when you are doing transcription factor binding site. The reason for that is this is based on a database, and this is not based on cheap seq data or such. So it's pretty limited. Many times, the, our knowledge about those binding sites or motifs are actually very limited. So you may want to lose it a little bit. Finally, I'd like to hear is it says gene limits. The reason is if you got a very large gene list, say 5,000 genes, that's about 25% of the entire genome. 
you're very likely to see many, 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 many things. Is that really meaningful? Maybe not. So many times we would like to limit our, the size of our, of our gene lists. Actually, my personal, I would prefer things less than 500 genes. So once you have this, you have just chosen, you can say start. It's going to take a while, depending on your gene list and depending on how busy their servers are. And for example, now you've got the results. And what you see here, it has input parameters. And if you forget how many genes you input, 34, and uh, those are the categories you selected, those are the kind of correction method you used, and those are the cutoff you have, and the range and such. Okay. And what do you have here? Molecule function, for example, in this case, we have 34 genes, and turns out 13 of them, those are from your gene list, it actually says, out of those, 34 genes are input, 179 annotations, because for many annotations in the molecule function category, those 34 genes, don't, none of them show up, so they don't even need to check. They checked for 179 annotations, and among those 19,242 genes in the entire genome, human genome, are in those 172 annotations. So it's pretty wide nest. And in that case, you, what you have is, oh, actually, I take it back, I apologize. Among the human genes, 19,242 genes have the molecule function annotation. Nevertheless, in this case, for this goal term, so-called uh, adenyl ribonucleotide binding, and uh, out of the 34 genes, 13, 34 genes, 13 of them have this annotation. In the entire genome of 19,000, about 1,500 of them has that. Think about this. In your list, it's more than one third. In the genome, it's less than 10%. So apparently, there is an enrichment. How enriched it is? The raw p value, as we mentioned, the feature exact, features ex exact test is about 1.1 times 10 to minus 6. If you do multi test compensation, there are different ways you can do that, but it's somewhere between. 10 to somewhere around the 10 to minus four, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Still very significant. But we care more is the biological process. In this case, we found out of the 34 genes, 32 of them related to nuclear division, 31 of them related to mitotic cell cycle. You may ask which ones, what are the 31 of them? You click on it, it actually will show you the list, it will show you the gene symbol, gene name, and the entrance ID in PubMed, in NCBI. Um, also, you actually can click on here to get a list of genes they used over the entire genome for that annotation. So this is another way you can download it. One thing you notice is it shows the top five. It does not necessarily just the five. Actually, here is it. There are a total of 50 of them are significant. They show the top 50. Actually, more than 50 of them are significant. And another way you can visualize this is they have display chart. You can click on the chart, and it will pop up another window or tab. So what you see here, here is some color bars and some dots and lines. One thing you need to be sure is before you start, you actually need to scroll to the bottom and understand what are the notations are. You have the bars. The blue bars means genes in common. That is, 
how many genes in your list have that specific term, say protein ubiquitination? How many genes? We don't know because the scale is on the top. And then how many genes, which is a red bar, is actually in the entire genome has that notation. And here's the black line with the round dot is a p-value. And but then those green ones or orange ones or is the blue ones actually is a p-value or a corrected p-value. And also there is one line, one red line here. It says selected cutoff. What is selected cutoff? You look at the bottom line, it says p-value. So 0 0.1, so select cutoff is 0 0.05. If you select it, 0.1, it will show up here. So in this case, you can see for those annotations, p-value wise, they are all less than 0.5. Um, but if you do multi-test compensation, they are no longer less than that. For bufferoni, that is almost one. But how about those numbers of genes? And this is where you see. And on top, it says total genes in term that is for the red bar. So if you look at the red bar, you see for the first term nuclear division, it's matched roughly to 1250. So a little more than that. But for the blue bar, what you need to look at is the second line. So it's more than 31, more than, more than 30, less than 35. When you click on it, show you actually it's 32. But when you look at the p-value here and the corrected p-values, they're all very, very slow, small. Actually, they're as small as that you cannot see it. Remember, if you go back, it's small like 10 to minus 37 or 34, 33. Either way, they're too small to even show. Uh, so that this is actually not very convenient. So that's why in another uh, tool, like in many other tools, what people actually nowadays commonly do is they will plot, they will convert the p-value using a minus log based on 10. So in that case, the longer the bar, the larger the p the, the lower the p-value. But for the top gene, they are still using the old way. So that's already give you a lot of information. And then you have the cellular component, you have the phen human phenotype. For some of the phenotype are pretty benign, sloping forehead. But some are actually diseases, soft tissue sarcoma. How many are known? Six are known to be related to soft tissue sarcoma. And 11 of them are un related to abnormality of forebrain morphology. So those are really abnormal phenotypes. For mouse phenotype, there is similarly the case that you can look at the protein domains pathways. In the pathways, it will show you not only the pathways, but where does it come from. In this case, the top five pathways all come from reactome database, as we discussed. But some could be from other things. Like in this case, it comes from pathway of infectious disease database. This one pathway come from CAG. So, and this one from pathway ontology, there are many different choices. And the one thing I would like to mention is interaction. So here, based on the different databases, here says out of 34 genes, 13 of them interact with CDK1. Six of them interact with BOB1. Those are all very important cell cycle or genome stability related genes. And in this case, what you can also see, out of the 34 genes, two of them on chromosome 4, Q27 band. This doesn't seem to be much. But one thing is, if you think about it, there are only 22 genes on this band. And that is about 0.1% of the entire genome. And you actually see two, which is about 6% of your gene, gene list. So there might be something in there, we don't know. Transcription factor, in this case, it seems five genes have, have the motifs for an FY transcription factor. 
So there are also other information. And uh, as we mentioned, there is PubMed. In this case, for example, there is one paper with a PubMed ID listed in here. And this is a topic of that paper. And what it found is half of your genes in their gene published gene list with 213 genes, among them, half of your gene list are in it. So this is a very significant enriched list. So it might be worth to take a look what's the commonality between the way you got your gene list and to their studies. So there are also other databases like the co-expression database. This is not, not from co-expression network mining. This is generally from some specifically studied. It's actually from a database called MSIGDB. And this specifically look at some gene modules curated based on some either published study or based on some analysis between, in this case, differential expression analysis. They have a whole bunch of gene lists curated in this so-called MSIGDB, and uh, they do the comparison with it. Similarly, there is gene expression atlas, and now they recently added the so-called top cell atlas because now we have the human cell atmap and more and more information being curated to that. And microRNA, and you can see in this case, 14 genes are predicted to be the target of MIR 133B. And that is actually from a prediction called the functional MTI. So are there real targets? We don't know. That still need to be validated. And uh, then you got the drugs, you got diseases. So this is a very straightforward tool for us to use. And uh, you can still go back to the start page to look for this. One thing is I'd like to mention, if you really want to know where do they got those gene annotations, and this is click on the gene database details. It will tell you where all the databases are used to curate those annotations for you to do the enrichment analysis. And how many genes has an annotation? And for example, for transcription factor binding sites, only 615 transcription factors are curated. So it's a very limited data set. And in that case, you may want to use some other specific web page for transcription factor binding site prediction if you want to predict the common transcription factors. And this is where I'll stop for demonstrating top gene. Thank you.